I would love to have a child with special needs. Those were the words that came out of my mouth as I sat in a meeting with my team of first grade teachers discussing the diversity of our students. I elaborated and I told them that if I had a child with special needs, I would advocate for them, make sure they were dressed nicely, make sure they were well taken care of and had all the things that their typically developing peers had and would experience. As a first grade teacher, I knew how I would approach inclusion in the classroom and how to be an involved parent. Oh yeah. And I forgot to mention that I was eight and a half months pregnant at the time with my healthy, typically developing baby boy. 15 days before my scheduled C-section, I went in for a final ultrasound before delivery just so I could see how much he was gonna weigh. After the ultrasound, almost an hour went by before someone came in the room. I contemplated a few times about leaving the room to see if they forgot about me, but they had it. Finally, the nurse practitioner opened the door less than halfway. Her body was clinging to the door with one foot in and one foot out as if she just wanted to deliver me a quick message. She said, Kelly, I think we see something in the scan. It's called a dilated umbilical cord. I've already scheduled an appointment for you with maternal fetal medicine. She hands me an, an appointment card reminder, as if this is an appointment that I wouldn't remember. As she told me this, my body tensed up. I could see she was very nervous as she suggested that I do not Google it. And hurriedly, sure, she assured me that I shouldn't be alarmed. Who knows what a dilated umbilical cord is? I don't. I asked her to explain more, but she didn't. She said I would get more detailed information at my next appointment. She leaves and I'm in shock, mostly because I felt that the medical team just dropped a bomb on me without any real explanation. And y'all know I Googled it. 13 days before my scheduled C-section, I walked into the maternal fetal medicine office. I was greeted by the front desk staff. They casually asked me if I knew why I was there. Yeah, I have a dilated umbilical cord. Their mouths dropped. That should have been the first sign to let me know that something was off. They escorted me to the ultrasound room. After the scan, the tech told me that the doctor would be in after reading the results. He walked in. We looked at the nuchal fold, noticed the heart defect, and duodenal atresia. Ms. Kaufman, we believe your child has trisomy 21, also known as Down syndrome. Do you have any questions? Only about a million and one. But at the moment, I got nothing. I was still in shock. I simply said, no, not at this time. They left me alone to, make, to take it all in and suggested I call someone, family. My husband, Travis, was hours away in training for the Army. No phone access for two weeks. My parents lived in South Carolina. I Googled my mom's work number after she didn't answer her phone a few times. When I reached her, I told her the info that, I had, that had just been dropped on me. My mom cried, but I held it in. She told me it would be all right. My husband's aunt and uncle lived in Indy and immediately came to be with me. The doctor explained that the only way to know 100% that my child would have Down syndrome would be to have an amniocentesis or just to wait to have further testing after I deliver. I opted to have the amniocentesis that day so that I would feel somewhat prepared for a baby that would be born into this world with Down syndrome. I knew in my, in my heart he had Down syndrome. There was just a peace within me. To this day, I appreciate how the doctor delivered the info, straight to the point, no emotion. It was as if he was telling me it would be okay without saying it. Deep inside me, I knew it would be okay. I had to use the American Red Cross to get the news to Travis. When I talked to him, he was so strong, so encouraging and positive. He said everything that I needed to hear. From miles away, I felt all the love and support. On January 27th, 2015, 
I told my family, friends, Facebook, and Instagram that my child would be born with Down syndrome. I made up in my mind that I would not hide my child from the world. I shouted his worth then, and I still do it to this day. My baby Cree came as scheduled, and we learned that he didn't just have Down syndrome. The day after he was born, he had a surgery that required us to stay in the NICU for a little over three weeks. Travis was able to stay for about a week. I had to juggle being alone with my eight-year-old daughter, Ryan, and a baby with complex feeding issues in a city where I don't personally have family. And Travis had orders for us to move in just a few months. Then there was the looming idea that Crete had to have heart surgery seven months after he was born. The Army moved us to Fort Lee, Virginia. Cree had his open heart surgery, and I remember the doctors pulling me and Travis in a small room after surgery and genuinely asking us if we were okay, checking in on our mental health. They told us they had never seen a family so calm. They were very concerned about us. Those years in Virginia turned out to be a huge blessing. It was there where we felt like our family grew up, where we became whole, I formed a support group of women that prayed with me, stayed with me, fellowship with me. I was able to witness the life experiences of women of all ages from different parts of the world. I joined a women's Bible study group. I felt pulled to tell people my testimony. While writing my story, I had a big realization. I verbally asked to have this child. It was so powerful. I remember giving my testimony to a group of about 100 women on a Wednesday morning. Growing up in the South, I had heard many people say there's power in the tongue and to speak things into existence. I realized that on that day, I was telling my teammates what I wanted. I was making a request. They say God will give you the desires of your heart, and he did. With wisdom, I came to realize that I have a purpose. I'm walking in it right now. I've been advocating like a mother. I joined all the Down syndrome groups, volunteered and joined boards both locally and nationally. I even recently started my own nonprofit organization that serves black people with Down syndrome and their families. Because there is an intersectionality between race and Down syndrome and I am now in a position to help do something about it. It hasn't always been easy. I was all in from the beginning. And along the way, I found out what stress was like, what worry was like, what anxiety felt like. After I had my third baby a year later, I started experiencing panic attacks. They came out of nowhere. Finally, one day, my mom sat me down to tell me I was doing too much. That's when I took the time to confront my feelings. I have been on go mode ever since I had Cree. And here I was with another baby the following year. She was right. I had to slow down. I had been advocating so hard for so long that my identity was being known only as Cree's mom. But I also had Ryan, who was eight years older, and Knox, who's almost two years younger. I struggled in my relationship with Knox because for a while, I didn't feel close to him. In fact, there are things I don't even remember. I now know that I was dealing with postpartum depression. And parenting Cree was such a large part of my life, it still is. But I've learned balance and how to let go. I've learned how to outsource help and be a better mom for all of my kids. Cree goes to school every day, dressed nicely, has all the things his typical peers have and experience. I am a very involved parent who believes that inclusion in the classroom works. I know that God gave me the family that I asked for so I could be a role model, an example for parents, and advocate for children with special needs everywhere.